Einstein once said that reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. And if that's the case, can we alter this reality or access a greater one? I sometimes think of reality as a mysterious tapestry woven from threads of existence and dreams that dances along the precipice of perception and truth, a riddle whispered by the cosmos, or perhaps a shimmering mirage in the desert of our senses, our oasis in a greater realm of chaos and madness, a realm where tangible meets the intangible. The apparent reality around us is a jigsaw puzzle to be solved a breathtaking mosaic of wonder inviting us to explore the secrets hidden beneath the surface of the everyday. Which is probably poetic but not very scientific, and as a physicist my job is fundamentally to help us find out about our universe and how it works, what reality truly is and how that extends beyond our normal human experience. Long before I was ever born, greater minds than mine had already helped us realize that the tiniest objects we could see were in truth huge landscapes of breathtaking complexity and detail, from the cell down to the molecule, atom, nucleus, or quark, and perhaps even beneath that. And we saw above that human scale that our world was but a pale blue dot in our own solar system and that but a dot in our galaxy. In living memory though we saw that the grand cosmos all around us, while ancient and huge, was not infinite. The observable universe is thought to be a million times older than our civilization, which itself is breathtaking in scope and history, and stretches out in a sphere around us 93 billion light years across, a million times wider than our own galaxy, a trillion times its mass, and a quintillion times its size. We believe it goes on for further than that, and possibly forever, but we also wonder where this universe came from and if it might have cousins and if our history may have a near-infinite number of alternate timelines, the multiverse that's often spoken of. This growing knowledge has not only told us more about reality but helped us to manipulate it, albeit in very mundane ways, at least in ways that seem mundane to us now. This is our topic for today, how we might manipulate reality and how various theories about our reality, if true, might allow that or prevent that. That reality might just be someone else's opinion, or subconscious collective consensus, and one we could learn to disagree with. But I feel we should begin by recognizing that we can manipulate this reality already. If I open a door, using my free will, to a room beyond, I allow things to flow through from there to here and vice versa. Some might argue that I have no free will and I'm merely following a predetermined and mechanistic script that moves bits around this playing board and that may be so. Perhaps I do have free will and in a way that overrides local reality, mind over matter as it were, and which may come from some higher reality as many believe. Or perhaps we can open a door to a different reality and then what flows through from there to here manipulates this reality. Were this so, these may or may not be part of some greater but still deterministic reality, much as we believe to be true in the late 19th century, pre-quantum when we will begin to document the sheer scope of the universe and the consensus was it was surely infinite. I sometimes find it ironic that as we learn to see far further away and deeper down with better telescopes and microscopes, we began seeing barriers where we expected infinity, edges to space and time, and fundamental building blocks who seem to have no divisible components. To discuss reality manipulation, we must first discuss what reality truly means because that sets our stage. If we limit ourselves to the clearly and classically physical, we can imagine altering time, altering physical constants like the speed of light or inertia of an object, altering particle lifetimes and possibly making new ones. Hardly minor abilities, but they are just the tip of the iceberg for contemplation, as we looked at in our episode Warping Reality last year. What we didn't look at there was what reality is at a deep and fundamental level, and this is in part because we do not know, but we have some ideas, and that begins with the concepts of objective reality, subjective reality, consensus reality, and virtual reality. Let's summarize each briefly. 
Objective reality is the perspective which asserts that there is an external, objective reality that exists independently of human consciousness. This is the default perspective of science, though traditionally as a matter of pragmatism rather than claiming it is proven. It tends to be our default perspective in our discussion here as well, but we do need to be mindful it is not proven and honesty is not provable, and thus should not be our sole perspective, particularly when trying to figure out how reality works and how it might be changeable. But in this view, reality is the same for everyone, and it exists whether or not we perceive it. So if I determine Mars is 142 million miles from the Sun, then you would determine that same thing, at least if we both did it properly. Similarly, if I measure a particle's position and momentum, you would measure the same thing, because it is what really is, and we are just measuring reality, not affecting it. Scientific inquiry often operates on the assumption of objective reality, seeking to understand the world as it exists outside of subjective experiences. By now, many of you have probably caught the problems there though because the core concept of special and general relativity is that the distance to an object truly is dependent on how fast you are moving relative to it or what gravitational field you are in. And because position and momentum are linked and hazy concepts under quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle, a first principle of which is that measurement not only alters the state of something, but can move it not just from unknown to known, but from being undetermined to determined. We believe that particle was not at a specific position until we forced it to be by measuring or interacting with it. Which takes us to subjective reality. This is the metaphysical perspective that argues that reality is shaped, or even created, by individual perception and consciousness. According to this view, different people may experience or interpret reality in unique ways, and there may not be a single objective reality. Indeed there are some cosmological theories that this would be entirely compatible with. For instance, multiverse theories around alternate timelines, branching from each possible future, are not necessarily limited to many different possible futures leading from a given moment, but also many possible pasts leading up to that moment. Imagine for a moment that your reality is of this type. Your consciousness is a real and unique thing, separate from the specific universe you and I happen to occupy at this moment. There are an infinite number of possible pasts and future states that could have led to the current moment we occupy, and your consciousness basically moves along one path and you might be able to pick which way you were going, or even which way you came from, and alter reality in this way. Or alternatively, we could simply assume that your mind genuinely does control your reality. This need not necessarily imply anything heavy on the mystical or solipsistic either. We may be in a simulation with cheat codes we could find, or which uses a lot of compression and is subject to influence by us. You might be a paying customer of a virtual reality enjoying a seemingly natural existence, but one you helped program and which responds to your subconscious commands, though not in a directly obvious fashion. You paid for a challenging but normal life, and whenever things get settled they throw a curveball at you. If they don't, then you might write them a bad review or sue them when you wake up. Or you could be some dreamy mind and this is your dream. Or you flip between realities in those dreams or any number of other scenarios folks suggested in a time before computers and brain scans. And those might be our reaction to make the dream seem more believable, we have found whole new lower layers of reality, dreamed them up, to convince ourselves this world is real and natural, and you can then manipulate reality through some parallel to lucid dreaming. It is important to remember that folks have asked if this is all a dream or illusion for many centuries and we have never in any way disproved that. Our reasoning is generally that you can't prove or disprove it in any way, but that there's no obvious advantage to assuming that our reality isn't real. Same as with believing in free will or not, whether reality is genuine or you have free will seemingly can't be proved or disproved so you may as well ask what the downsides are to believing you have free will and this is all real if it turns out one or both is wrong. Nonetheless, it does not make it true, and it is worth noting that if this reality is fake, whether your own hallucination or deception by someone else, the setup is likely designed to encourage you to not waste time contemplating those questions too much or too seriously, and it throws a warning in there that learning how to manipulate reality might open that Pandora's box. 
The ability to manipulate reality might seem to imply there was a higher reality of which we were but a subset or shadow, indeed this is what they are called in Roger Zlasny's classic Amber series, which features a family who come from a realm of which every other world, including our own, is but a reflection or shadow, and they can walk between these places to any reality they desire. The main protagonist of that series, Corwin of Amber, spends a lot of time waxing philosophically about if they're going to the places or making them, and what that says about ethics of interacting with those people. Great series incidentally, written in the 1970s and one of the strongest influences on this channel, which sadly hasn't stayed as popular in recent decades as some other classics. The latter half of that series, written in the 1980s, explores this in a computer and virtual reality context and is a good analogy for the concept, indeed one of the first and best sci-fi discussions of it. Virtual reality, if detailed enough, could be thought of as a reality, and yet is subject to change from this higher reality, and there's no reason this higher and lower layers of reality concept need to involve computers specifically. The line between conventional and natural and the supernatural gets rather hazy and arbitrary when we cannot assume physics and basic operating principles are the same there, in a higher reality. I generally take the standpoint that when discussing various layers of reality, computer simulation or not, that the term real is honestly not very helpful. We have a long history of assuming we are this or that divine being's creation or dream, and that they exist in some other or greater realm and we don't usually bother saying that this reality is therefore fake as a result. So again I don't think treating virtual reality as a fake reality is very helpful, since it's really more about quality and breadth of the simulation than whether it's happening on the substrate of computer chips, neurons, or whatever demiurges use for an analogy to brain matter. While contemplation of this topic can often get decidedly metaphysical and even mystical, we definitely see it get explored more in the new wave era of science fiction in the 1960s and 70s, which is when we see books like The Chronicles of Amber, or Samuel Delaney's classic Dahlgren, and writers like G.J. Ballard, Michael Moorcock, Philip K. Dick, and Frank Herbert's Dune all tend to be far more metaphysical and often sacrifice classic physical science in sci-fi for more mind-bending and reality-warping plots. These tend to be heavier on prose and flavored with a lot of postmodernism, which often correlates to subjective reality. Also compared to Golden Age space opera, they are frequently grimmer and involve anti-heroes, trope deconstructions, and often very Kafka-esque settings. I should also note that in between objective reality and subjective reality, we also have consensus reality, the idea that reality is often shaped by consensus within a particular group or society. What is considered real or true can be influenced by shared beliefs, values, and cultural norms. Consensus reality can vary from one cultural or community to another. A variation of this, to use virtual reality as an example, would be a world in which the rules and events were not one single person's dreams but everyone else's combined vision. You are on an interstellar arc ship to a distant star, and a large portion of the colonists have opted to be in a dreamlike virtual reality state which they share to maximize resources and be maintained by some agreed upon parameters and a constant subconscious pulling about how things should be occurring. Thus you're not really noticing how much reality changes according to your wishes because it's a big group brain decision limited by some common sense parameters built in to keep folks from dreaming up crazy world ending scenarios. This is not an episode on virtual reality, and we're mostly using it as a familiar vehicle to explain concepts, but pre-computers it was a pretty common thread in the 20th century to suggest we were all a little bit telepathic, and part of some planetary consciousness that controlled events. This could easily be how things worked out though if you did have folks who could manipulate reality, as they might share a world that was operating on a consensus of what was real. Needless to say, it helps to know how reality works if you want to manipulate it, and if you do live in some subjective reality, then we might as well be talking about magic as much as technology as it's more of a personal technique thing. We are going to take the stance for the rest of the episode that objective reality is the correct one, unsurprising I'd imagine since this is a science channel, but I wanted to make sure we cover those others too and to acknowledge that the metaphysical reality in which we exist is not something we actually understand or are certain of. And it needs to be part of our discussion because when we just think of warping reality in a strictly physical way, we are ignoring possible solutions. You want a faster ship, you give it a more powerful engine, 
or you make one that pulls energy from nowhere, or maybe you shrink space between point A and B, or maybe you just circumvent the need for the ship. You don't need to ship colonists to a new world or bring metal back from a distant asteroid mine because you simply make your planet larger or rewrite the rules so things aren't used up. Think of a virtual location, some fantasy game planet from an RPG, and how we would add size to that, and we don't need to mine any other place to do it or even follow Euclidean geometry, the new maps don't have to match borders. It's not simply a way to casually break the rule for a moment like a cheat code, but to rewrite the entire game, to forge things we could normally only imagine, the sort of strange structures we only see in the drawings of M.C. Escher or wards only imagined in Fever Dreams. You can do that in virtual reality, of course, your steam engine just keeps running on fumes even after you shut off the water and fuel because it was told to, but a consequence of doing too much of that might be reality breaking down. You have a decanter of endless water that keeps pouring water on your garden, pulled from nowhere at all, and everybody uses them and the planet slowly floods. That's a fairly simplistic example but illustrates the point. The changes to reality would presumably tend to have consequences, like any other action, but they might start stacking or getting contradictory. Especially when we start contemplating ontological weapons, those which don't simply remove you from the universe but attack your existence itself. Examples might be a weapon that didn't just kill you, but killed you backward in time, deleting your actions for the last hour, or day, or year. If you imagine many people using that, you could have someone killed who was resurrected because you blasted their murderer out of existence with that weapon. In the Wheel of Time series, which is one of my favorites, they have something called Balefire that does exactly that and they have a war it gets used in by both sides who stop using it because reality is starting to fall apart. Later, the side that is crazy evil starts using it again with that destruction of the current reality specifically in mind. An ontological weapon is not necessarily related to time travel, retro-causality, or paracausality, but technologies involving reality manipulation of either space or time would tend to inherently do either and determining what came first or is above or below a given layer of reality is not necessarily the same as implying one can control or dominate the other. We could imagine a technology invented in a few centuries for making pocket universes, and where you could have topology where you had a pocket dimension only accessible from certain real space gates at certain places or times or both. This is a reality which is spawned from our existing one and yet which is way more likely to be the place you built your capital at and seems implied at times to be the situation with Gallifrey, the capital of the Time Lords of Doctor Who, though canon on that show is even more scrambled than the timelines of a show with casual time travel would normally have. Another example and maybe an inspiration for that is Isaac Asimov's classic novel The End of Eternity, where we have the Eternals, a group of humans who live in a pocket space that stretches between the moment of its invention to the death of the sun and which is itself immune to the time changes they routinely enact on the universe outside, which would imply it was the dominant reality and yet someone is able to build a device that goes back in time in the normal universe before the creation of the place and causes it never to be made. It is not clear from the book why this is possible and of course it is a piece of fiction, but I think it stresses again the idea that if you're playing with reality it tends to imply you can tinker with some substrate it rests upon. I can rewrite a page of a book and those in it can do nothing to stop me. Though in our episode Hacking the Simulation, we did discuss ways you might be able to alter that more foundational layer of reality from inside it, in this case that a mind inside a simulation might be able to affect the outside real world. And in the book's case, perhaps a moving passage appealing to the writer to give the protagonist a happy ending, or abandon writing anymore. What do we truly know about our own reality, even assuming an objective reality? If this is the one true reality, not some shadow or lower level or just one more chunk of the multiverse, it does beg the question of where the initial energy of the universe came from. And that's a common one, and we have no answer, but you may have heard references to quantum fluctuations somehow giving rise to the whole universe. And while I've heard folks then say, this is how the universe could have arisen from nothing, that's not what's being implied there. If you saw our episode on zero-point energy and vacuum energy a couple months back, you know that momentum and position are linked under the uncertainty principle. 
and under a certain threshold, the more certainly we know its position or momentum, or speed, the less we know the other, and again that's in the context of it being unknown because it truly isn't determined. We have made something's speed or momentum less real by insisting on knowing its position with greater accuracy, or by making its position more real. Indeed if you saw that episode you probably recall me referring to our scale and the atomic scale and the quantum one below as various levels of reality and that wasn't intended as poetic license. I tend to feel that's a very appropriate way to view the situation of massively changing scales and emergent systems, as they are essentially the substrate the next layer up is built upon and from which its rules derive. Every bit as much as how a virtual reality on the substrate of a computer works, and indeed the biology of your own neurons and their connectivity and whatever our consciousness is. The quantum uncertainty is a very weird, real, and counterintuitive aspect of reality compared to our own, and it does leave the door open to something seemingly insane like our whole universe being a quantum fluctuation. In this universe, energy and time have the exact same relationship momentum and position do, the better we know the one, the less well we know the other. We have a layer underneath us, the quantum foam from which material can pop into existence for the briefest moment, and the bigger or more energetic it is, the shorter that moment of existence. That sounds surreal, but it is a more fundamental reality than this one that's built upon it, and the existence of these quantum fluctuations is about as proven as something can be at this point. Now anything as energetic as our Universe would seem then to be able to last only the most insanely tiny piece of time indeed less than the Planck time, as such a fluctuation would seem to imply about 10 to the 70 joules of energy, and thus under the uncertainty principle something on an order of 10 to the negative 114 seconds of duration, which is even smaller to a Planck time than a Planck time is compared to the age of the Universe. Indeed this would be even worse as I left out dark energy in there, and we also assume the actual Universe extends well beyond the observable portion and we obviously have lasted longer than that ridiculously tiny time interval I just mentioned, but the specific quantum foam we refer to is generally assumed to be part of this Universe, and Planck's constant is quite probably specific to our Universe, so their local rules don't necessarily matter, they are just the physical evidence that something like that could happen under the right circumstances. You can also make the argument that the Universe has net zero energy and that all the positive energy of mass and space-time is balanced out by the negative energy of gravity, but I think that works better in an assumption that there is an underlying reality that we are resting on that the Big Bang is a fluctuation out of, rather than the implication we had a huge fluctuation from an actual genuine nothingness itself, which might be the case and is the subject of some energetic debate inside physics for a long while now but without much evidence to back any viewpoint. What can be agreed is that quantum fluctuations in this universe can spawn things for a brief moment of time, shorter the more energetic, and based off a physical constant, Planck's constant, whose value might be different at other times and places as it were. And that's a good place to wrap up because physical constants like that probably have their value for some reason, but that reason could be luck of the draw and might be subject to manipulation here too. It has been suggested the speed of light might have changed over time in this Universe, not just that it might be different in other Universes. If you can alter the speed of light, you can travel impossibly quick between places. If you can alter the gravitational constant or the Hubble constant, you might be able to build impossibly large megastructures, slow Hubble expansion, or unravel black holes themselves but if you could alter Planck's constant, you might be able to create new universes on the spot, or maybe destroy one. And if that doesn't count as reality manipulation, I don't know what would. One thing I love about the holiday season every year is that it tends to bring out people's kind and generous side, and I've rarely regretted giving a gift or donation, but sometimes found out that donation wasn't well used. There are over 1.5 million nonprofit organizations in the United States, and millions more around the world. How do you know which ones can make the biggest impact with your donation? GiveWell was founded to help donors with that exact question, 
They pore over independent studies and charity data to help donors direct their funds to evidence-backed organizations that are saving and improving lives. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. You can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities and GiveWell does not take a cut. GiveWell has now spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org and pick YouTube and enter Isaac Arthur at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur to get your donation matched. Again that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. So that's it for today, but next week we'll look at discussing silicon-based life forms on December 21st, followed by a bonus episode for the holidays where we'll ask if we truly will colonize space. Then we'll finish the month and year with clearing space to be on the 28th and our final livestream Q&A on Sunday, December 31st. And then we'll move into our 10th year here on SFIA with a return to the Fermi Paradox and a look at pan Theory, and the idea that colonizing other planets around distant stars may simply be ecologically unfeasible. Then we'll have a bonus episode on 8 typical satellites like the Statite, Ligite, and Quasite on Sunday, January 7th. Make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons to get notified about those upcoming episodes. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content, like this month's Nebula-exclusive episode, The Hermit Shop Little Hypothesis, at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.